Welcome to Healing Generations, a podcast creating a dialogue uplifting the importance of healing, strengthening, and supporting our communities, and that addresses the disparities and inequities in communities of color. Healing Generations is brought to you by the Healing Generations Institute, a collaborative initiative of the National Compadres Network and the Brotherhood of Elders. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on our new releases. Welcome, welcome to Healing Generations podcast. We are so excited. This is our podcast from the National Comadres Network. And we're so glad that you're joining us today. Wherever you are around the world, we are so happy that whether it be three o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the afternoon, you're here with us. So thank you. We don't take that for granted. And as a podcast that reaches out to the mujeres across the world, we just want to say, we know the value of your time, but the multitude of things that you have to do. And so that doesn't go unnoticed or thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Comadre, I don't know how you're doing over there down in uh, the city of Angels, but up here mm -hmm. in the Bay has been some beautiful weather and we're saying goodbye to the last super moon of this uh, year, right? And uh, so how's it going down there? Oh, thank you, Maestra. So good uh, talking about City of Angels. You know, I'm, I'm still in the clouds, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, I had the beautiful opportunity of participating and witnessing uh, the marriage of my first daughter, Paloma Valentina, uh, to her partner, Stephen C. Pack. And it, it was a beautiful ceremony, a beautiful wedding, and just really giving thanks to Creator and Ancestors for making that possible and just letting everything flow the way it needed to and uh, seeing everybody come together, familias, and um, being introduced to another familia and just coming together and um, just sending prayers for both of them as they continue their, their yes. new journey together. And, wishing them many blessings along the way. Yes, the beauty of, of familia. And we were had the pleasure to, two weeks ago, celebrate my mother's 90th birthday. And yes. so uh, the continuance of that legacy. So you have one beginning, and my mother's in that third phase of life, but still with all her faculty. So we're very, very blessed uh, to have her in that way. Um, which leads us into today, right? I mean, it's the matriarchal legacy that is so powerful. You know, mm -hmm. um, they always say, right, we're born from our mothers and we go to our mothers, you know, at the end of, of uh, the transition here in this dimension. And a lot of strength that comes through that, right? As mujeres, mm -hmm. you know, we've had to uh, learn to navigate so many things, but being able to do that is such a gift. And we carry that heart wisdom, that heart healing. And so today I'm really excited because we have a guest that's uh, going to take us on a new adventure. Uh, mm -hmm. As we have another platica, you know, being able to explore someone else's life and how she does it. And I'm excited mm -hmm. because I know her personally and it's been a joy for me to work with her. And uh, I know she brings a lot to the community so I'm excited to get on this adventure today, this platica, with our special guest today. So do you want to give an introduction and let's uh, let's get this show on the road? Absolutely, comadre. So excited. Uh, I know you've spoken to me. We've had many platicas talking about uh, our special guest today, Gabriela Rojas Martinez. And wow, what a powerhouse. The little that I know of you is, is just amazing to me. And I, and that's why I was so excited. I was like, oh, I just want to meet her in person. I just want to ask her a million questions and I want to <laughs> uh, learn about her journey and, and how um, she's been able to, to navigate and rise above and, and just have that courage, that perseverance, that, that persistence to just keep going forward, you know, always adelante, whatever the odds are. And, and it's so beautiful. So for our guest, Gabriela Rojas Martinez, born and raised up in the Bay Area, San Francisco's Mission District. She is the proud daughter of Irma Angelina Rojas Turcios, a single immigrant mother from Guatemala, 
Although Gabriela has had to face many challenges personally, academically, and professionally, Gabriela has defied the odds. Gracias a Dios and the ancestors, all those that protect her and keep her going forward. She has went on to earn her BA as well as her master's degree in social work and has worked for over 20 years supporting communities and families on her journey. Her emphasis is working with young students, 6th to 8th graders, providing academic, social, emotional support, as well as teaching them about their own personal wellness for their own well-being within all the environments that they have to adjust to, that they're in. She's also incorporated traditional indigenous practices, including Danza Azteca and Mayan fire ceremonies, as part of her spiritual practices as well. Gabriela will be starting on her next uh, adventure of earning her doctorate of education in international and cultural education with an emphasis on racial justice and education. Wow, so powerful. How do you do it? How do you do it? It's, I just, right. <laughs> it's amazing to me. It's amazing. But um, I'll uh, pass the palabra to you, and maybe you can share a little bit about your journey, a little bit about yourself, your background, and your familia, your practices, whatever comes out of your heart. This is your moment. This is your time to just comadreando with us right here uh, and share for all those that are listening, especially, you know, our mujeres that, that are looking for those same consejos, that same wisdom, that those things that help us as mujeres to continue going forward in a balanced way and a wellness, you know, with our well-being. Anything that you can share, I know it'll be golden nuggets for all of us. So adelante, Gabriela, if you would please honor us. Of course. Buenas tardes. Um, first off, thank you so much for the invitation to participate with, with you both. Hearing you like read these things about me and I'm like, wow, really? That's me? Um, <laughs> you know, and I visited my acupuncturist not too long ago and, you know, I was rattling off these things and she's like, wait, why are you doing that? Why are you going back to doctorate school? Why are you doing these things? And and I'm like, well, because I want to, because I can. And she's like, you know, you make all these things sound like it's just normal, but it's really not. You really do a lot. And, and I'm like, but it's normal to me. Right. Like, you know, I think about some of the things and I'm like, well, no es cosa de otro mundo, right? Like it's not this big extravagant thing that can't be done. But, you know, to me, it doesn't seem a, a huge thing, but apparently other people think that I do huge things. I don't know. But the interesting question, how do I do it? And I think as you were speaking and as Deb was speaking, you know, we just keep going, right? We just keep moving forward. And from as long as I can remember, that's always been the teaching. That's always been the message, right? We just keep going. We keep moving forward one foot in front of the other, one step at a time. A veces llevamos prisa. Sometimes we can take our time, but we're going to keep going forward no matter what. Whether it was, you know, the example of my abuelita or the example of my mom. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. We just we keep moving forward mm -hmm. no matter what, no matter what challenges life can throw our way, what challenges get put in our path, what obstacles, you know, we go over them, under them, through them, around them. We're mm -hmm. just going to keep going forward. Mm -hmm. That's that's all we can do. Mm -hmm. So. Absolutely. So, Gabby, I know because I know you that you were raised by a strong mujer. And I know that who you are carries that spirit forward. But it's the essence, right, that lives within us that helps us then to develop our own trajectories in life and stuff. And I'm just wondering, can you share a little bit of that upbringing, those lessons, those words? And I know it's a tender subject, but it's one that I think we as mujeres need to hear, right? 
because sometimes it's really easy to devalue ourselves and to devalue our experiences and to devalue really the wisdom that's that's all around us. And so, you know, I, I want to ask you to share about that and any lessons that come to your mind of how your mother helped you become the person that you are. Absolutely. Honestly, I wouldn't be the person that I am without my mom. Mm -hmm. My mom came to the United States in the early 70s from Guatemala. She was the fourth oldest of nine children. A lot of her youth in Guatemala was spent taking care of younger siblings, nieces and nephews, you know, just taking care of others, helping my abuelita with family all of those things. One of her sisters had come to San Francisco beforehand. So my mom and another one of her sisters came together in the early 70s and made a life here to do what my mom was doing, what she could to help my grandma. Mm -hmm. Again, from as long as I can remember, before I have conscious memory, my mom every month would, you know, send money back home, send money to my grandma, whether it was for, you know, just her basic household needs, like her groceries and stuff like that. And then later on, it was for medications, medical treatments, things like that. And then after my abuelita passed, she continued supporting her only brother, right? My grandparents had nine children, eight girls and one boy. So he was the prince of the family, right? The only boy. And so my mom continued to, to help him. I was recently telling my husband the story that I was smuggled into Guatemala and then smuggled back into the U.S. So in December of 1976, my mom traveled to Guatemala, pregnant with me, and then you know, cross the border back to the United States, pregnant with me. So I'm like, oh, so I got smuggled out and smuggled back in, right? <laughs> you know, but the, you know, th that was at that time, there had been a big earthquake in Guatemala and it was important for her to go home and physically see her people, right? And not just <sighs> communicate via letters, because at that time, you know, long distance calling and all that was a lot more than anyone could afford. So it was letters. So it was waiting for news a long time just from letters going back and forth. So she physically went to go see her people and then said, OK, I'm I'm good to go home. Well, her new home. And so I grew up in a household with my mom and her sister and myself until I was, let's see, probably 16. And then my mom and I left that living situation and we were living on our own. And, you know, 80s, I grew up a latchkey kid. I would get myself home from school. I would take care of myself, take care of my homework, do all my stuff. My mom would come home, make dinner. We'd eat dinner and then it was time to go to bed. Right. So in retrospect, there was, of course, a time when I was like, I want more time with my mom. I want to spend more time with my mom. Why can't she do things with me? Why does it feel so uh, disjointed in some ways? And in retrospect, of course, and I've done a lot of work around around this type of, of thing. You know, my mom always did the best she could with what she had. And her emphasis was always on providing for me and helping her family. And so my mom always, always told me from when I was very, very young, you have to go to school. You have to go to school so you don't have to work hard like I do. My mom cleaned houses. My mom worked construction and was up on roofs of homes when she was pregnant with me. And then after, I guess, she got far along in her pregnancy, she was like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't do that. And she switched to cleaning houses. And she cleaned houses for like 30 years or something like that. I don't even remember how long. And she would always say, you know, there was times when she would clean two big houses. She'd work on Saturdays. She'd work in the evening sometimes. And she would always tell me, you have to go to school so you don't have to do the work that I do. You have to do this. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my school journey 
was interesting. I skipped second grade. I tested into the GATE program. I went to a high school in San Francisco that was, you know, like for all the smart kids. But that was in the early 90s when then there was affirmative action. So I had a school counselor tell me, well, you're only here because we had to meet a quota to make sure we had enough Latino kids. Mm -hmm. And I had a Spanish teacher who, you know, a freshman in Spanish three honors. The teacher was not happy about it. And, you know, there was often the struggle because, you know, she was teaching very like La Academia Real de España Spanish. And I'm like, you know, she's saying these things. I'm like, what does that mean? She was like, I thought you were in Spanish three honors. I'm like, we don't say that at my house. And, you know, so she would use like vocabulary that I was like, what? No, that doesn't make any sense. We don't say that. And so my mom requested a meeting because she was like, how are you failing Spanish? And I'm like, this teacher, she don't like me. She don't speak right. Uh, You know, all these things. So my mom went and had a meeting with her and the teacher told my mother, well, you know, I'm just not going to put that much effort because she's not going to graduate high school anyway. She's going to probably end up pregnant and dropping out. That's terrible. And I think those types of experiences, I, I think I've I've had this, it's just in my DNA, but these types of things fostered my mentality or my drive to tell me I can't do something and I'm going to tell you, watch me, right? So I was like, oh, okay, you don't expect me to graduate high school. Okay, great. High school was an interesting experience. I did end up getting referred to the dropout prevention office. I transferred to a different school, much different, much better environment. When I got my graduation announcement, I went to the old high school and dropped it on the school counselor's desk. And she was like, oh, so nice to see you. I just dropped it on her desk, turned around and walked out. Like Mm. I I was not going to respond. So nice to see you too, because it wasn't for me. Right. You know, and so you know, that kind of drive of like education, education, education. Mm -hmm. Um, I did get pregnant when I was 17, gave birth to my son five days after I turned 18 and went to college. Anyways, my mom supported me fully, was a great support for us in all ways, taking care of him when I was in class or, you know, helping me pay for childcare if the student loans didn't cover enough or you know, things like that. So my older son graduated from preschool when we graduated with our BAs, my husband and I. So we graduated preschool and college at the same time. And, you know, just, we, we just keep going. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And just, you know, that there was that drive for education, that drive to always keep moving forward, the drive to, you know, when they tell you, you can't do something, you figure out a way so that you can. Mm -hmm. Right. And just, Keep moving forward. Life is going to try to knock you down along the way and Mm -hmm. go, okay, you know, yeah, sometimes I need to sit down. Yes, the universe will tell me, sit down. And I go, okay. (laughs) And then it's like, okay, well, take the opportunity while you're sitting down to figure out how you're going to get up and keep going. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that's the main lesson I think that I ever learned from my mom was that no matter what, you always get up and you keep going. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. It's just so resonating with me, uh, so much of what you shared already, you know, starting off with, you know, having a teacher tell me the same thing. You'll never be nothing, you know, so just save your money. Don't go to college, go somewhere else, you know, get another type of job because, you know, you'll never have what it takes, you know, and it's such a spirit wound really to hear that. And it's really takes a lot of strength to be able to get past that spell, if you will. That's kind of, it just reminded me, like, like she just spell casted me right there with that. And, and for me to get out of the illusion of what she was saying, that no, that she doesn't get to dictate what's going to happen here. That's between creator and ancestors and you. That's not, be, right. you know, due to somebody else. So I so, so resonate with that. And, and it was at that time, you know, after I got told that, that I just felt hopeless and, and like, well, then, you know, what's the point of being here, you know? But I was also very blessed when I was about to just give up and just check out, you know, to be introduced with my maestro of la danza, Florencio Yescas, uh, in 1977. And it was that medicina 
and that connection, learning about the elements and, and the ancestors and, and all those things that are really, really important and um, who we really are, who we really are. I, I can honestly say if Creator hadn't have made that connection at that time, I probably wouldn't be here right now because it, it's been such a powerful force of medicine for me and continues to be. We mentioned earlier in your bio, you know, you incorporate your Lanza Azteca, your mind fire ceremonies. I, I'm wondering if you would be willing to share whatever is comfortable with you, how you have been able to incorporate these practices and how they've helped you just maintain, maintain your own spirit, your own well-being, as well as all these beautiful students that are so fortunate to have you as, as a teacher and a guide, um, how you utilize these teachings to support them as well. The first time I saw Danza Azteca, I was pregnant with my child. Mm. Um, and I thought, you know, and then, of course, the drum beat. And then the baby starts kicking. And I'm like, oh, yeah, we're feeling this, aren't we? <laughs> um, you know, and I thought, mm, yeah, I'll find them. I'll figure it out. Through some friends, found our circle. Chico at Danza Azteca in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, my jefes are Miguel and Irma Martinez. Irma Alvarado Martinez and Miguel Martinez. Let me not get that wrong. And I'm very fortunate that they're also my suegros, right? Oh, so um, I love Irma. <laughs> Abrazos, Irma. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I was mentioning to Junior, my husband, yesterday. I was like, do you know Susie? He was like, oh, yeah, I know Susie from way back. And I was like, mm -hmm. cool. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, and so bunch of college friends. We all kind of went to Danza together. And, you know, 26 years later, here I am still, still in Danza, still involved. You know, fairly early on, I was asked if I would be interested in being one of the Samadoras for our group and carrying the the smoke, carrying the fire. And I was like, sure, if you show me what to do, I'll, I'll try. Mm -hmm. Of course I will. And just really being able to step into that role and integrating these things that we know in our DNA, mm -hmm. biologically, we know them. And then we go and we do them and it's like, oh, like you never s missed a beat. Like you never, like you never didn't do it. Yes. You know, so it that's what dance has been for me, right? It started with dance. We've also participated in Mayan fire ceremonies, which I feel very connected to the fire. And it's it's one of those things that, I'm a very much an analogy person. I think a lot in analogies. And for a long time, I've thought to myself, like, we all have a fire inside of us. And our jobs as human beings having this experience in life is to tend to that fire. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the fire can get a little wildfire, yes. you know, and se quiere descontrolar and, you know, go across fire lines and, and do damage, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's other times where that fire is very, very low and it's like, it, is it about to go out? Right. Yes. And then then our job is to cultivate it. Right. And to and to have it grow stronger. Right. And I'm not sure about this word, but being able to manipulate that fire within us. Right. Being able to manage it and foster it. Right. Mm -hmm. To to a place of equilibrio. Right. Mm -hmm. Where we're where our fire is in balance, mm -hmm. you know, to give us enough energy to keep going, but not be out of control where we burn ourselves or Absolutely. others. Right. right. So I think, you know, working in mental health, experiencing, you know, different ups and downs as well, just in life, through life. That's been something that Danza has helped me with mm -hmm. is tending to my own fire. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and knowing when, you know, when I got to fan it and get, get the flames going and when it's time to watch and contain. Right. Mm -hmm. I think, so I work in a private school where I don't get to on a day-to-day -day basis, share these things with my students. Mm. And so what I do is that I take care of myself in the morning before I go to work, mm -hmm. right? And I'm, I ground myself in these practices. And, you know, every morning starts with prayer, you know, creator, ancestors, 
you know, let's have a good day. Help me Mm -hmm. tend to my fire so that I can tend to the fire of these young children. Mm -hmm. Right. So all of the kids at my school are students of color. They come from under resourced communities. You know, they all qualify for the free lunch programs, whatever, you know, whatever those qualifications are right now. And so our school is designed to support our students to be able to thrive in rigorous academic environments. Mm. Mm -hmm. Even though they may have home situations, family situations, all sorts of different factors that could impede that type of progress for them. Mm -hmm. So each one of these kids, that spark in their eye, that wonder, that curiosity when they're learning and when they're you know, meeting each other. We're, we're starting school this week, so we're going to have a whole new class of sixth graders. And so they're all going to be, you know, so they're, they're coming in with this like curiosity, that spark. Mm-hmm. And so in my mind, my job is to tend to that spark for them, you know, and so I take care of my fire so I can help them with theirs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is such an important point. And I really appreciate you speaking to that because sometimes we find ourselves where it's easy to preach something and not practice it, right? Right. Or another way we say it is walking the talk. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely what you're sharing is that really if we can't do it and if we don't do it on that daily basis or incorporate it, as a lifestyle within our our day to day, then really it just becomes words. It just becomes, you know, some sounds that float out there because there's no, no tienen espíritu, no tienen corazón, right? The words. Mm -hmm. And I think when I think about mujeres that I have a lot of respect for, for those women that are out there really doing the work, that is something that you find within their lives is that they do walk the talk. They do practice what they preach. And yeah, maybe they might not be getting all the visibility, you know, or all the accolades and acknowledgements because they're just so humble practicing and living the way that they're sharing, you know. But I do um, recognize that it's that component of really being able to live the fulfillment of your words that creates that opportunity to live in balance, to live in wellness, you know, to live a quality of life that brings peace and joy and within yourselves, because the world's going to do what it's going to do. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to have ups and downs mm-hmm. all the time and we have no control over that. But then how do we navigate that in a healthy way? because that part's not going to stop. And I know in the things that, you know, uh, we do in working with a lot of young women and and we talk about these things and the reality is that they got to go home to the madness, to the neighborhoods that are still on fire, mm-hmm. you know? And so I really appreciate that sharing part of incorporating the teachings within our life. But I want to bring out this other part because... Gabs, you you are a mujer with a lot of adventures. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I mean, because your life has been very colorful, which is so cool. And, and, uh, you know, and I hope you share a little bit more. But one of the things, too, I think that part you opened up, that lesson of just not laying down, not giving up, but just going forward, right, from your your head by your mom. The other part is that you've been able to Uh, enjoy other things and so for instance interior design so Mm. she you know also has that in her a little notch in her belt amongst a lot (laughs) of other things but you know can you share some of that other colorful stuff you know uh, that you have uh, experienced in your life sure um (laughs) it's interesting you bring that up and I get teased about this. I'm better than the FBI when it comes to searching for things on the internet. If it exists, I will find it. Uh, so if you need anything, you know who to call. But I was looking something up at one point and I came across this concept of a Renaissance soul. 
of being a person who enjoys many, many different things. And I am a self-proclaimed nerd. I love learning about everything. <laughs> and um, I'm a lifelong student. If I could be paid to just learn about anything and everything, that's the dream job, right? Mm -hmm. Just pass me a check while I take classes, learn about things, etc. Yeah. So th these are, you know, los caminos de la vida, right? That mm -hmm. that take us all these different ways. When I was at school for my undergrad, I initially declared social work as my major. And then mm -hmm. I had a class and then I talked myself out of it. I freaked myself out and I said, nope, can't do it. Can't do social work. It's too emotional. I, there's no way I, I will never be able to do it, et cetera, et cetera. So I have a degree in consumer and family studies with an emphasis in interior design and housing. So I'm a, yeah, I'm an interior designer um, <laughs> by schooling. I've also, let's see. I've been trained as a birth doula, a postpartum doula. I'm a trained hypnotherapist. Um, <laughs> what else? I'm sure there's some other things that I'm probably forgetting because I learn things and move on, right? Mm -hmm. Because now I learned it and great. Now I know. Next, I want to learn something new. <laughs> um, some people would say that it's a feature of ADHD and maybe it is. I don't know. I never been formally diagnosed, um, but I learned the DSM. So yeah, probably. I probably meet criteria <laughs> for ADHD and I'm okay. I'm okay with that. <laughs> you want to put a label on it? Sure. But I like mm -hmm. learning about all sorts of different things. And I've had the um, privilege of being present at some beautiful births and being in the room when a baby takes their first breath is one of the most privileged things that you can experience, right? And there's one particular young lady that I'm thinking of that I saw her take her first breath and I still see, see her now, you know, she's mm -hmm. now she's going to be leaving to college. Wow. Um, you know, mm -hmm. so like being able to be part of people's lives in different ways, uh, autoimmune conditions tried to sit me down. They made me slow down for a little bit. I was diagnosed with uh, rheumatoid arthritis when I was, I want to say 27. And that's been an interesting adventure, right? It's reconciling a relationship with the body. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, for a long time, I, I was angry. I was angry at my body. I was in the mindset that my body had betrayed me because it turned on me, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, my body turned on me and it's, this is not okay. Now I'm mad. Mm -hmm. And that's been an interesting journey because, well, I'll give away my age, but I was diagnosed in 2004 and now it's been seven years that I have been off all of my medications and mm -hmm. I am in remission and my disease is not active at all. There are no signs wow. of, of disease activity. And the lesson that I learned through that adventure has been to step into my own power. Mm. Right. And I recently switched to a new primary care doctor for a bunch of different reasons. And my first interaction with him was I sent him a message through, you know, like uh, the email portal. I sent him a message and I said, welcome to my medical team. Right. Like, <laughs> By the way, I'm in charge. You're you're my doctor, but I'm in charge, right? Like you went to school, you got all the degrees, you do all that. But I live in my body 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you see me maybe 10, 15 minutes, maybe once a year or if something's going on. So this is how we work, you know, um, you know, so it's but being able to step back into your own power, like mm. a lot of systems that we have to interact with are meant to disempower people. Right. Right. It's not an accident that the exam tables are raised up high. So your feet are dangling and you feel like a little kid when this doctor walks in the room. So, right. The power differential mm. already. Right. So all of these systems that, you know, we're not supposed to be empowered in, we step into our power and we take it back. Right. Mm. And so 
a couple years ago, I had shoulder surgery for a torn rotator cuff. I had to have it repaired or whatever. And the second surgeon I met with was that one who actually performed my surgery because I fired the first one. <laughs> and when I called and I said, I need another consultation about my shoulder, they're like, well, you met with, you know, our top shoulder surgeon. He's the shoulder guy here at this hospital. And I said, well, he might be the shoulder guy, but he's not my shoulder guy. So I need to talk mm -hmm. to somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, and so like being able to reclaim our voice to be able to do those mm -hmm. type of things within different systems. Right. It's not just the healthcare system. It could be the educational system. I work with a lot of parents where I'm telling them you have to advocate for your kid. I'm trying to help you advocate for your child. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to teach your children to advocate for themselves. Right. Yeah. And so like stepping back and, and, and reclaiming some of those things, because yes. if we don't, what are the alternatives? You know, we're going to keep stuck in these systems that they're not designed for us. They're not designed for our success. I tell my students that all the time. These systems were not created with you and me in mind. We're not mm -hmm. supposed to succeed in these systems. Right. Mm -hmm. But we have to show up. We have to show that we can, and yeah. then we get into the systems and we change them from the inside out. Mm -hmm. You know, like I know there's so many movements about capitalism and, you know, all of these things. And yes, all those things are true. And I still have to prepare my students to not only survive, but thrive within those systems because the changes that need to happen for those systems to be equitable and just, I really don't think are going to happen in my lifetime. They might not even happen in my children's lifetime. If they have kids, maybe my grandkids will see some change. But it's mm -hmm. going to take a long time because that 1% that really benefits from systems being the way they are has really dug their heels in and they are not going to let the system change. So we have to do it for, you know, we have to find different ways to yes. do it. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. That's very obvious to me that um, creator has spent a little more time on you and <laughs> <laughs> ancestors are continuing to be right there behind you. Yeah. Your awesome team of benevolent mm -hmm. beings to mm -hmm. give you that strength and keep that fire burning mm -hmm. to make this happen. Everything you said, I, I agree with what you said. It, it's so important. And, these children do need to learn, you know, how to navigate in this world as we go forward in order to not just survive like we've had to, but to thrive and be able mm -hmm. to, to live and, and be in control of, of like you said, of, of our bodies, of our choices, of, of what's best for us, you know, for our well-being. It might not be everybody else's idea of what's the best thing to do, but, you know, learning to pay attention to that and, and follow that that inner guidance of what makes me be more in balance and, and a better whole person. Uh, what do I have to do to bring that balance to myself? You know, and it's beautiful that you have this traditional background, you know, to keep you grounded, to keep you strong, to keep you dancing, if you will, paso de camino, one step at a time, always going forward, never backwards. It's a living tradition. And I feel like, you know, you talk so highly of your mother, her consejos, her wisdom. Uh, it's obvious you have learned by her example. It's obvious you continue to be guided by her. And, and that voice never leaves your heart of continuing to learn, continuing to, to be the best that you can be. I'm just wondering, um, from the perspective either of of your traditional danza ceremonies, your Mayan ceremonies, as well as your mother's wisdom, you know, for this next generation, what is maybe some of the highlights of the advice that you have learned that have worked for you, that have been passed on to you, that you feel that you would like to lead to this next generation as they move forward on their journey that can help them? What are the traditions that you want to continue being a living tradition for many more generations to come? Mm, that's an interesting question. Is it okay that I interpret that question as like consejos to pass Any on? Any way your spirit feels. Mm. Let your spirit speak for you. I think 
one of the things that I've really been moved towards. So tomorrow will be eight weeks since my mom passed mm -hmm. to spirit world. Mm -hmm. And it's been very impactful, of course. And I'm being very mindful and intentional to be present in my grief mm -hmm. and, um, you know, to keep moving forward. Because mm -hmm. if I didn't move forward, it wouldn't honor my mom. Right. And so I've had experiences. I'm in touch with my council of elders. I'm in touch with my council of ancestors. Actually, that's what I'll call them. It's my council of an ancestors. And, you know, I'm very open to be like, mm, nope, my abuelita just said no. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. um, yes. You know, because I feel her and like, I feel my abuelita. I feel my mom. I feel my ancestors all around me. But I think the thing is that my ancestors are within me. Yes. You know, and so, so a couple of things. We are not put in this world to be mediocre. Mm -hmm. The revolution of our ancestors, right? Mm -hmm. our, our ancestors have been in revolution for hundreds of years and they right. continue to be. Their revolution lives in every cell of our body, mm -hmm. right? So we honor that revolution by going and doing great things. Maybe sometimes we don't think they're so great, but others might, right? So there's that part, right? Like we can't dishonor our ancestors by, you know, just kind of half stepping through, through life. Mm -hmm. Take up space in places they said you never would. Mm -hmm. These spaces mm -hmm. are not designed for us. Mm -hmm. Get there and take up space own them, make them our spaces, mm -hmm. make all of those spaces ours as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Academia not designed for people who look like us, but so many black and brown people are going into higher education and getting those degrees, the pieces of paper that end up on the wall that somehow we get to give validity to what we do, you know, we got to take up spaces there. We have to. We got to transform the systems from the inside out. And the only way we can do it is by being our authentic selves. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. My principal, she's really funny. You know, she likes to tell a story about me that, you know, she really saw me about a year into working together. And that was because I made some random off the cuff remark about somebody who that I was observing that made me just like think to myself, like I immediately covered my mouth and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I just said that. Like, come on brain. Those are inside words. Like these are things you keep to yourself. And she looked at me and I was like, oh my God, I'm in so much trouble. She goes, I see you. I really see you. Right. And it's like, there's nothing wrong with letting ourselves be seen. Mm -hmm. And this is coming from the person that likes to fade into a background. I don't want to be noticed. Mm -hmm. I don't want anybody to know my name. <laughs> you know, all of these things. And I'm like, mm, well, we have to be our authentic selves. We can't do it any other way. Doing it any other way is just, especially working with middle schoolers, they'll see right through you. Yeah. Working with young people, they see right through you. There's mm -hmm. people who, who see they observe, they pick up on energy, they do all that, and they see you, right? And some people, they're like, oh, wow, you, you're you you're really good at that until you see them. And they're like, oh, no, wait, don't see me. It's like, mm -hmm. uh-huh, right? But it's that piece about being able to be your authentic self, really step into that voice, use your voice, reclaim power. Mm. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. Don't leave anything unsaid. Mm -hmm. love each other fiercely openly with everything you've got because you really don't know if there's going to be a time when you can't share that love that you have with the person you want to give it to mm. right. and for me that's that's where i'm at in my grief right mm -hmm. i have all of this abundance of love for my mom that i can't give her in this physical realm right and so I have no regrets and there's still so much more I would have wanted to have done and said. Yes. 
Always. You know. Always. Always. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I love that statement you just said right now, that Creator didn't design us for mediocrity. Mm -hmm. that, that is such a powerful statement because there's also this other wave, right? To just get by with whatever you can get by with. And uh, like Maestra always says, todo nada. You know, we're all in it. <laughs> we're not in it or around the tiger, got to write it. And I, I just appreciate that. And I know that the listeners that are hearing this, um, these are words that are really going to help answer and bring clarity to some things that they might be thinking about, you know, or decisions that need to be made. When you say, okay, so how do I come in more alignment to my authentic self? And how do I take that space? Because maybe I'm a little fearful mm -hmm. because of maybe some trauma in my past life. Or how do I just show up sometimes when I don't even feel I'm enough? Mm -hmm. How do I show up? And so, Gabby, I, I would ask you to share some words with those mujeres that are listening today. And from your heart, what words would you give them as we're wrapping up this podcast? The first phrase that came to my mind was, don't believe the hype. And the hype that's not to be believed is that you don't deserve to be in the spaces that you're in. Right. It goes back to, you know, systems that were not designed for us. They're meant to make us feel like we're not enough, like we don't belong, like we are not worthy. We don't deserve it. But we do. We do deserve it. Being able to use our voice for ourselves is our birthright. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's what our ancestors gave us. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, I think there's a sometimes a, an unspoken pressure to, you know, like, oh, well, in order to, you know, be good enough, you have to reach this level or that level or do this thing or do that thing. And that's not, that's just not true. Existing as your authentic self, that's, that's the assignment. Existing as your authentic self in alignment with your teachings, your ancestors, you know, we all have different ways that we walk on this planet you know, through our spiritual practices, our culture, our costumbres, our, all of those things. So there is no necessarily right way to do any one thing, but we do it authentically with our full selves, de todo corazón, for the greater good. And sometimes the greater good is me. I am the greater good, <laughs> right? And so if people can start to believe that they are the greater good, can you imagine? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right and so believe that right mm -hmm. we are the greater good mm -hmm. and to live in alignment to that authentically that's the assignment mm -hmm. and it's a work in progress always mm -hmm. well thank you thank you so much for your words and we are so honored and we're so grateful to your mother to your grandmother, yes. you know, to your grandma's grandma uh, for bringing and giving you as a gift to us here. Your words have been words of wisdom. And I always say on our podcast, you know, there's there's those words that you needed to hear today that's going to give you a little bit more healing in your life. And I know as you were listening, you are not disappointed. Mm -hmm. And so thank you. Thank you for joining us today on this podcast. And I don't know about you, Maestra, but man, there's a lot that I am taking with me from this conversation. To be continued. <laughs> to be continued. Uh, it will be. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Oh my goodness, Gabriela, just a powerful force for, for this next generation. And uh, just give me thanks to, to all your ancestors, all, you know, your mother, all those uh, maestras, maestros that have come into your life to, 
to keep you going forward, to keep your fire burning and to keep you dancing with life, dancing through life uh, one step at a time. I guess the, the words that, that are coming to me right now are, are the words of my maestro, Lorenzo. Vamos a seguir adelante. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to thank everyone for being with us today. It's been a pleasure to join you with our guest, Gabby, today. And also remind you that you can find us on the National Compadres website. Just go there, look for Women's Services. National Comadres are right there. And if we can be of assistance in any kind of way, if you're looking mm -hmm. for connection, if you're looking for women's programming, if you just need an ear sometimes to just hear you out, we can direct you to someone that would want to spend the time with you. So thank you again for being with us today. And um, this is Deborah Luis Camarillo calling it a wrap for today. And my hermana down south, Susana Armijo. And our guest is Gabby. You want to say goodbye to our listeners today? Thank you, everyone, for listening in from the Sunny Bay area. So, with that, thank you very much and bendiciones. 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 For more information about Healing Generations and the Healing Generations Institute, visit nationalcompadresnetwork.org and be sure to subscribe to stay up to date with our new releases.